Greenland near Winthrop, Washington, where elite firefighters are getting ready for fire season. And look how they're doing it. I'll have the story coming up. And El Nino might be gone for now, but his little sister is on the way, and that might not be good news for our weather. What we can expect next on Como 4 News at 5 o'clock. There's a new commitment to you from Como 4 News by combining the best technology and the best people. We call it the Air Force Response Team, a helicopter that can carry more people faster than any in Western Washington. An expert pilot and crew who responds with the closest possible pictures. It's more than just a machine. It's a commitment to bring you more local news. The Air Force Response Team from Como 4 News, first for local news. First for local news, Como 4 News at 5 o'clock. Good evening. A manhunt is underway right now for a rape suspect in Pierce County. He was accidentally released from the county jail about an hour and a half ago. Como's Molly Shin is first on the story. She joins us live from the Pierce County Jail with the latest. Molly? Sabrina, this was a terrible mistake today made with a man who is now considered a dangerous fugitive. We'll show you his picture right away because it is urgent that police and sheriff's deputies in this area find this man as soon as we can. We should have his photo for you. It's there on the screen. His name is Clinton Troy Garrison. He was arraigned today on nine counts of first-degree rape, three counts of first-degree burglary, and three counts of third-degree theft. His bail was set at $1 million, in part because he has a history of not returning to work release. But when corrections officers took him from the courtroom to the jail this afternoon, Garrison took advantage of a paperwork snafu. There was a release set of paperwork and then an arraignment set of paperwork. What happened was the release set of paperwork got processed before the arraignment set of paperwork and uh, unfortunately he was released. Now as we speak, Garrison's photo and description are going out to other police agencies, up on flyers, out to taxi cab drivers. We'll show you his photo and his description one more time. His name again is Clinton Troy Garrison. He's 33 years old, stands five foot six. He weighs 160 pounds, has hazel eyes and brown hair, and a tattoo on each arm. One of them is a heart with an arrow going through it, and the other one is a cross. Now, if you see him, you should call 911 immediately. Again, police consider this a dangerous man, and they wouldn't want you trying to approach him yourself. Absolutely call 911 if you happen to get to catch sight of Clinton Troy Garrison. This just happened late this afternoon, so we're still gathering some information. We'll have the latest for you as it develops. Reporting live in Tacoma, Molly Shen, Como 4 News. Let's hope he's found soon. Thanks, Molly. Starbucks won't be just a coffee house anymore. Seattle's latte leader is about to start serving dinner and alcohol. Como's Ken Schramm reports the idea of asking for a different kind of double shot has some folks all riled up. How about an evening coffee laced with a little brandy? How about a fluffy egg white omelet breakfast along with a glass of champagne? How about something called Cafe Starbucks? I uh, say, well, if anyone can pull off a, a, what looks to be a casual dining a situation, Starbucks could. It seems Starbucks is certainly going to try. The Seattle coffee purveyor has applied for a liquor license at its soon-to-be-expanded Madison Park store and for its new store in the still-being-built Pacific Place retail complex in downtown Seattle. It just seems really strange to me. I don't know. I think there's enough Starbucks around. I don't think we really need Starbucks restaurants. The folks at Starbucks think differently. The intention seems to be to launch a couple of pilot cafe Starbucks, and the reception to the idea, well, depends on who you talk to. Starbucks are cropping up everywhere now, I mean, all in other countries now, and it just seems like they kind of are spreading at a massive rate. I just think it, the idea of a restaurant just seems too much to me. Some people who live in the Madison Park area are still not quite sure about a Starbucks that will serve alcohol and provide entertainment. They worry some about late night noise and the drinking. I don't think a liquor license would necessarily be any more of a problem than any of the other establishments here having one. But seem to ultimately trust in Starbucks and its customers. Probably the same sort of crowd that is interested in buying their coffee and other products is the same crowd that would go to their cafe. Company officials won't say what their long-term plans are for Cafe Starbucks, but quietly confirm that if the two experimental locations they've selected are successful, this could be where Starbucks would like to hang its future hat. Ken Schramm, Como 4 News, the Madison Park area of Seattle.
For a brief period, the Medicine Park Community Council was thinking about protesting the Starbucks liquor license, but it now says it will trust in the company's promise to keep things low-key at Cafe Starbucks, scheduled to open sometime this summer. A Seattle Fire Department hazardous material team checked out an ammonia leak in a tanker train in the Interbay area this afternoon. They put on their special suits to take a good look, but couldn't find the source of the leak. By then, the fumes had dissipated, and the fire department turned the tanker back over to the railroad. No one was hurt. Nobody evacuated. The FBI is looking for a young bank robber who reportedly held up the Wells Fargo branch on the Issaquah Plateau today. The man, described as in his early 20s, used a handgun to force three employees into the bank's vault. But he left the door ajar so they could get out. He also left with an undisclosed amount of money. Thieves hit a Seattle school. The target? computer equipment. But if they thought they'd find a quick market for what they stole, Como's Brian Johnson says they're wrong. This city is making life difficult for computer thieves. Sometime over the weekend, someone climbed the fire escape and jumped in through an open window at Seattle's Hebrew Academy. It looked like vandalism. This Torah was unscrolled. Two projection TVs were broken, but the real loss came behind this now locked door. Three computers are missing. I think they probably just came in for a lark and found some brand new computers and thought, great, we'll sell these. So where do you sell a computer? One store which says, we buy computers, is Computer Renaissance. I'm going to ask you what your, basically I'm going to ask for your ID. It has to be a state or a federal ID. As part of a new citywide police and industry yeah, crackdown, Paul will ask you to fill out this form. We're also taking the serial number and the model number of the laptop, and we turn that into the Seattle Police Department. And remember, he's got a picture of your ID matched to the serial number. Another twist, police are sending lists of active burglars to computer shops. And the blotter gives us, gives us information as uh, sex, date of birth, um, their actual name, and then any aliases that they actually use. Or have. Despite the crackdown, computer theft continues. In laptop theft, we'll see one or two laptops taken every week somewhere in downtown Seattle. Many of the stolen laptops wind up somewhere outside Seattle, sold where police are not quite so attentive. But technology may soon catch up with these thieves. If your notebook computer is stolen and you had a certain software program on it, you're not out of luck. This new software program, well, as soon as the thief signs on to the internet, it screams out to a monitor somewhere, I'm stolen and here's where I am. Brian Johnson, Como 4 News. One of the laptop tracking programs is made in Vancouver, B.C. It's called CompuTrace. The company says several stolen computers have been successfully reunited with their owners. We've already been shocked by some of the dropout rates in our schools, but we're about to get an even bigger shock when school districts start reporting dramatically higher student dropout rates. Como's Margot Myers tells us why the problem is worse than we thought it was. 19-year-old Kaylee Alden dropped out of school three different times. The last time during his junior year at Bothell's Inglemore High. I planned on making music, you know, and I could have stayed in school for music, but I really didn't find a program and chose to do it myself. Kayle is just one dropout, and now the number of students like him that districts report are about to change in a big way. State lawmakers are demanding a new way of counting students. The Bellevue School District has been counting students over four years, from the time they're freshmen until they either graduate or quit. Most other school districts count year to year, which means a lower dropout rate. Now the state says everyone needs to keep track the four-year way of counting. And Bellevue's district spokeswoman says it's about time. We're glad everybody else is going to be doing the same thing. In the past, Bellevue's dropout rates have been higher than other districts. In 1997, it stood at 17 percent. Seattle reported a rate of just over 12 percent that same year. But tally it the new way, Seattle's dropout rate more than doubles, more than 28 percent. It's another method of tabulation. We're happy to do it. Seattle schools say even so, the dropout rate is at its lowest since 1982. There are now alternative schools, summer sessions, and more encouragement for academic achievement. The district says the bottom line is not the numbers. What matters is getting the most kids to graduate on time as possible, so we're more than happy to, to be accommodating to the state. No matter how they count it, the key for districts is to get to kids like Kaylee before they become a dropout statistic. In King County, Margo Myers, Como 4 News. The new dropout rates are expected to be out in December. 
Arson investigators now say incendiary devices apparently sparked the fires that damaged two federal buildings in Olympia. The buildings housing animal research offices were torched early yesterday morning. No one was hurt and there weren't any animals in the buildings. Investigators say if the arson was politically motivated, suspects could be charged with domestic terrorism. No arrests have been made. Authorities are releasing the identity of the teenager shot at a party over the weekend. 15-year-old Justin Womack died last night at Harborview Medical Center. Investigators say teens were reportedly playing with a gun at a party in this house. A 16-year-old boy was arrested. Now prosecutors will decide if he should be charged. Two lanes of I-5 were blocked by this rollover accident near Shoreline today. Lots of cars were involved. One person was hurt. His injuries are not life-threatening. Local hospitals want your blood. It's no laughing matter. There's a serious shortage of blood at Puget Sound area hospitals. Unless more volunteers step forward to donate, some elective surgeries might be canceled. One of the reasons for the shortage is new life-saving medical treatments that require lots of units of blood. The jury in the Wenatchee sex ring case should resume deliberations tomorrow. They got the day off today when a juror called in sick. So far, they have spent six hours deliberating. They're deciding if the city of Wenatchee and the police department falsely accused Pastor Robbie Robertson, his wife, and many others of molesting Wenatchee girls four years ago. Robertson wants between 30 and 60 million dollars in damages. One of Seattle's top tourist attractions might get hit with another one-day strike. Produce farmers might stay home tomorrow rather than display their goods at the Pike Place Market. It follows a one-day strike yesterday. Farmers and especially craftspeople at the market are upset over a proposal to give growers preferential treatment. There's fear the idea would hit everyone at the market against each other, which could end up with stall operators walking out for longer than one day. I don't know if they could shut it down, but I think they could put a big dent in it. Because yeah, the market is the heart of Seattle, isn't it? Isn't it? And people come here for the market. Yesterday, several stalls were vacant as a protest against the proposed change, which goes up for a final vote tomorrow afternoon. Fish and wildlife officers make the kind of bust you'll only see here in the Northwest. I'm Joe Furia in Belfair, and this is a gooey duck. Some people will look at this and say, mmm, that looks good. Other people will look at this and say, mmm, I bet that's worth a lot of money, and they'd be right. In fact, gooey ducks are worth so much money that poaching is becoming a major problem in western Washington. What you're looking at here is about 300 pounds in gooey ducks taken in an early morning bus this morning on Hood Canal. Do you know how much money that these poachers can bring in illegally harvesting gooey ducks? It can be thousands of dollars in just an hour or two's work. So it's becoming kind of a cat and mouse game between the poachers and the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Those are the people trying to cut down on all of the poaching that's going on right now. It's a story that we are currently working on, and we will have a complete report tonight at 6.30. El Nino warmed up our winter, but next year could be very different. Another major weather system is on the way that just might change the way you look at temperatures changes in the Pacific. It's called La Nina, and you'll hear about it first here on Como 4 News. A monument to the new millennium is on its way up. And the woman behind the Mars Pathfinder mission brings her story to the Northwest. And I'm Steve Poole. Let's check out our time-lapse forecast for tomorrow. After yesterday, you would be hoping that we'd get to more sunshine. Not going to happen. Some clouds in the offing for tomorrow and even a chance of some showers later on. We'll talk about that, get you updated on all of your temperatures, and look ahead to the chance that some sun's going to return. Stay with us. Como 4 News, back after these messages. The winner of the Emmy for Outstanding Reporting, Como 4 News continues. One year ago, NASA's Pathfinder spacecraft landed on Mars, inaugurating a new era in the search for life on the red planet. The manager behind all of NASA's missions to Mars is in Seattle today. Donna Shirley headed the design team for Pathfinder and the Sojourner robot, which got all these great pictures from Mars. Shirley is excited that her work may help discover that Mars was once a more life-friendly planet than we ever imagined. And if it was a warmer, wetter, friendlier place, then life might have gotten started there. And that's really what we're after is, did life ever start somewhere else in the universe other than the Earth? Because that would be a pretty profound uh, finding. Shirley calls it appalling that there are so few women participating in NASA's space programs. I get tired of it, but because it's so appalling that there aren't more people like me. 
Shirley is in Seattle to talk about her new book, Managing Martians. She'll be speaking at the University of Washington's Kane Hall tonight at 7 o'clock. If you would like tickets, call the University Bookstore. Still looking up for just a moment, the British celebrated the building of the Millennium Dome today. Prime Minister Tony Blair stood atop the skeleton of the future dome and pledged to help make January 1st, 2000, he said, the greatest day in the history of the world. It's part of a big public relations campaign to win over a British public that isn't in love with the giant dome it's now paying for. The dome is scheduled to open the first day of the new millennium. By the way, the British say the Millennium Dome will be the largest covered structure on the planet. You know which one currently holds that distinction? It's the Boeing 747 plant in Everett. El Nino is just about gone, but he has a little sister. Her name is La Nina, and she means more weather trouble for us. Como's Washington, D.C. correspondent Tom Walker says the weather watchers have their eyes on this one. A four-letter word to many Californians and to other victims of the extreme conditions it unleashed around the world, all caused by last year's warming of waters in the Pacific that showed up on computer screens as a superheated band along the equator. What's happening now has forecasters just as concerned. It's gone cold. Bob Livesey has been watching the same area of the Pacific dropping in temperature and fast. So it's extremely rapid. It's, uh, in some senses, it's almost unprecedented. And what that means for the Northwest shows up as green on the latest forecast maps. Green as in very wet. By late fall, look for weather that may have a lot of people heading for higher ground. The biggest floods in history in the Pacific Northwest have happened during the fall when there was a strong La Nina. And this one appears headed that way. You're going to have enough precipitation to put you in the the wettest third of all historical years. Ironically, Livesey says the rest of this summer will be drier than normal in much of the Northwest and colder next winter. He says that doesn't necessarily mean more snow. And he says it's too soon to know whether this phenomenon will wreak the havoc and the billions in damage of its predecessor, but not too early to worry. Forecasters here at the National Weather Service believe they were right on the money in predicting the impact of El Nino giving them all the more reason to believe La Nina will live up to her expectations, too. In Washington, D.C., Tom Walker, Como 4 News. Forecasters say La Nina technically doesn't even exist yet, but could develop within the next two weeks. Up next, an explosive message that might keep you safer this summer. Plus, another drama unfolds on Mount McKinley, what rescuers found when they reached hikers stranded for three days in wind chills 100 degrees below zero. Well, it's that time of year again with the 4th of July less than two weeks away. Just some things to keep in mind if you're planning on buying some fireworks. First of all, make sure they're legal. How do you know? Legal fireworks are the kind that stay on the ground and don't explode. Here are some safety guidelines you can follow here. Light one firework at a time and then move away quickly. Have a hose or a bucket of water handy for emergencies. And always, always have an adult present when using fireworks. What is legal, what is not? My, the way I look at it is if you can buy it in your city, that's what you can use in the city that you live in. If you go to other states, other places, and you buy it, it may not be legal in your city. Seattle and Tacoma have bans on fireworks even on the 4th of July. So you want to check with your local fire station to see if there are any restrictions where you live. And of course, maybe the best thing to do is to check out our show on July 4th. That's going to be a lot of fun. Fourth of July, first. boy, time does fly by. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. It's a Saturday night this year, and I think we're on from 10 to 11 10 o'clock. 10 to 11. All and, the great fireworks. Yeah, and those stuff, see, those can go up, and those can explode. <laughs> yeah. They're very nice. And a special surprise treat this yeah, year, Yeah, I've too. got a couple of interesting things on tap, so make yeah. sure you tune in. All right, All right let's, uh, let's check on our forecast here, and we'll begin by taking a look at some of our live weather cameras around the area. Down in Tacoma, this is the view that they have of Mount Rainier at this time. Just beautiful, 68 degrees. We started off with the clouds, as you know, but things cleared away, and we got some sunshine for you. Let's journey up uh, north just a little bit to Juanita. That's in the Kirkland area, as you know. Real pretty there, and lots of green trees, but a little bit of sunshine, too. 69 degrees in Juanita, Kirkland. All right, let's get to our official stats out at SeaTac. We have partly sunny skies right now. It's 68 degrees with a west wind at 10, 2995. The barometer's holding steady. Our humidity's at 61%. And there's your high today, 
69 degrees. So, uh, yeah, I know it wasn't like yesterday, but uh, that's acceptable. We're pretty close to our normal of 71, the record 92 degrees set, uh, interestingly, in 1992. All right, where to from here? Doppler radar shows us there are already a couple of showers showing up. They're real small, some right here, just coming off the Olympics over to the Kitsap and back of that as we head through the summer because it will become very clear whether or not that's going to occur. And if it mm. does, generally what it means for us is the opposite of El Nino in the winter, and that means wetter mm. and colder. Oh, boy. Okay, we'll keep track of that for you. We've been warned. Yeah, Thanks, Steve. A mountain climbing rescue has a happy ending in Alaska. A National Park spokeswoman says everyone who was in trouble is now off Mount McKinley. Two British climbers were rescued today after being stranded for more than three days in bitter cold with no food. We had heard they were in bad shape on Mount McKinley, but now an Anchorage hospital says they are in good condition. The mighty bone will sail no more. See the historic battleships welcome into Pearl Harbor when Como 4 News continues. Plus, a local man says slanderous email unfairly linked him with the Oklahoma City bombing, and America Online was to blame. We'll tell you if the Supreme Court agreed. And are geese causing the bacterial problems at area beaches? If so, they could have a problem of their own. I'm Kim Reamland. I'll have that story next on Como 4 News. Watching Como 4 News at 5 o'clock. Three King County beaches are still closed to swimming as investigators try to find out why harmful bacteria levels are so high. Como's Kim Reamland is at Juanita Beach. Boy, Kim, the timing sure seems bad. It really is a shame with all of the nice weather we've been having that people can't come out and enjoy the water, but the beaches aren't exactly empty. In fact, all day we've been seeing all kinds of groups of geese and ducks and all kinds of waterfowl, and scientists along with beachgoers wonder if maybe this is the very problem. And it gets worse as you get farther down towards the shore. The last time Monique McCann and her son came to Maidenbauer Beach, she couldn't find a place to lay their beach towels. There's fecal material all throughout the park. It was all, all over throughout the beach area. Little children were dropping their toys in the sand area and were picking them up and putting them in their mouths. The problem isn't new, but it seems to be getting worse. Many of the geese don't migrate anymore. They stay, they eat, and then, you know, and that's the problem. It's not like people haven't tried to get rid of the geese. In Kirkland, trained dogs shoo them away. Some grass is sprayed with a chemical that makes it taste bad to geese. Well, we've tried a number of control methods over the years. We uh, first relocated the geese to eastern Washington. Um, then we've moved in the last few years to egg addling, and that has enabled us to roughly stabilize the population. But there's some feeling, given the conflicts that are still going on, and maybe this water problem, is that there's already too many. A while back, there was a proposal to reduce the population by killing some of the geese. It was controversial when the droppings were seen as just a smelly inconvenience. This is becoming a health hazard. If tests show that the geese are a health hazard, it may be hazardous to their health. I think we would revisit the issue of lethal control if we find that they're contributory to water quality and health issues. And it will be two to three weeks before the test results are in that show exactly what is causing the high bacteria levels. Scientists think if not waterfowl, it could be a case of leaking uh, sewer pipes. Now until those tests are in, this beach will remain closed to swimmers. Reporting live at Winita Beach, Kim Reamland, Como 4 News. Kim, thank you. A Seattle man who was inundated with abusive phone calls over an offensive internet hoax has been turned away by the United States Supreme Court. The court left intact a ruling that frees internet providers like America Online from legal liability when subscribers send info out on the web. The justices dropped a Seattle man's lawsuit over a phony internet message that made him the target of death threats. The prank ad on AOL offered tasteless t-shirts about the Oklahoma City bombing and gave Kenneth Zirin's phone number. His lawsuit accused AOL of failing to notify subscribers about that hoax. A Chicago real estate mogul will reportedly pay top dollar for this Seattle high-rise, $412 million to be exact. An insider says Sam Zell is about to close the deal on the 76-story Columbia Seafirst Tower. The Puget Sound Business Journal reports that $412 million would be the record price locally and could create a ripple increase in the cost of other downtown commercial property. And another piece of history will soon have a new home, but this time it stays here in the Northwest, the Spruce Goose. Howard Hughes' enormous plane that only flew, flew that is, for a few seconds 
will have its own museum in McMinnville, Oregon. Construction starts in September, opening sometime in early 2000. If you have trouble sleeping at night, the reason might be under your feet. How the scale could unlock the key to pleasant dreams when Como 4 News continues. Plus, the infamous British au pair tells why she thinks she was prosecuted in the first place. I'm John Sharifi, and this is my cell phone, and my blood pressure is going up. That story coming up. Como 4 News continues. Obesity might come with sleep problems. New research from Penn State's College of Medicine finds that overweight patients were much sleepier during the day than a control group, and they had problems sleeping at night. Well, here we go again, another study. This one about the harmful effects of cell phones. But before you hang up, Como's John Sharifi says, you need to know one thing. You see this guy? You see this guy? You see this woman and this woman? and this guy? Well, if they see this story, and they really should, they will see that doing this and this and this will make you smarter. Uh, no, that's the wrong study. Actually, this study is about blood pressure. What about it? Using cell phones increases your blood pressure. It's the electromagnetic field from the phone. Hello? It can increase your blood pressure. Yeah to a dangerous level. Yeah. For those people who already have high blood pressure. Yeah. Huh, that's interesting. Then that means that my mom's gonna have a heart attack. She talks on that phone a lot. But before you freak out, which is what these kinds of studies tend to do, you should know how many people they used in the cell phone blood pressure study. Uh, like a hundred. Thousand. Oh God, I don't know. 10,000. No, no. Higher? A million. They went all across the country. Ten people. I don't think that's valid. I don't at think all. that's. I don't think that's enough. A phone, some tape, and voila! Each volunteer had the phone strapped to their head so researchers could monitor blood pressure levels. Hey, hon, what's for dinner tonight? No wonder they only got ten people. No wonder their blood pressure went up. I'm oh, just doing a story. In Seattle, John Sharifi, Como, Four News. I think she told him not to come home for dinner tonight. <laughs> the results of that blood pressure study were published in the medical journal called Lancet. An international incident over sewer repairs that's happening in Belarus. Ambassadors locked out of their homes, packed up, and left the former Soviet state. Government officials say they want to fix the sewers in the homes of the American, French, British, and Italian ambassadors. Ambassadors say that's garbage. No word when or if the ambassadors will be invited back to Belarus. I think 279 days is a long time for an innocent person to serve. Despite her conviction by a Massachusetts court, British au pair Louise Woodward continues to say she's innocent, and she's gone on British TV to do it. Woodward was convicted of manslaughter in connection with the death of this baby in her care. Now she's getting panned in England for how she looks in a BBC interview. Some Brits say she's trying to get sympathy by dressing like the late Princess Diana. Paul McCartney has planned a final farewell for his wife, Linda. You see them here in Seattle in 1994. The service is about to get underway in New York. That's where she was from. Linda McCartney died in April from breast cancer. The battleship Missouri arrives at its new home, Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, to the delight of people there. The Mighty Mo will take its place on Battleship Row with the USS Arizona. The two ships represent the...